Firecap Motorsports is one of the premier engineering design teams here on campus. We're an entirely student-run and led organization. Each year we design, build, test, and compete with a brand new formula-style race car. We compete with hundreds of other schools from around the globe when we go to our two competitions each year, one of which is in Michigan and the other one is in California. Everything on our car is designed by team members or modified specifically for our vehicle. We work with 30 plus sponsors that help us manufacture and fund the car. Many of our team members actually end up getting internships or jobs with these companies. We use a variety of different software tools to help us design the vehicle. We use SOLIDWORKS to create a complete CAD model of the vehicle each year. Additionally, we use some of the built-in tools to analyze components to drive design decisions, such as finite element analysis. We use other software like Star CCM for flow simulations, where SOLIDWORKS lacks the power to run complicated external flow sims. We are always trying new software to help better justify our design decisions. In conjunction with our simulations, we run tests to validate and iterate on our designs. Not only is PowerCamp Motorsports a great place to learn good design practices, it also allows you to manufacture the parts that you design. We use many different processes to manufacture the car each year. Water jet, laser cut, CNC machining, manual machining, welding, and 3D printing are just a few that we use. Additionally, we do both prepreg and wet carbon fiber layup for our chassis and aerodynamic packages. These all provide unique experiences that help develop students into well-rounded engineers. Okay, good morning everybody. Welcome to the Midwest Dream Car Collection. Thank you for coming out today. What a gorgeous morning we have out there. And enjoy a little bit of the warmth before it's supposed to snow again, so we'll suck that in all we can. So anyway, um, we have a really awesome presentation today on this race car here. Not only is the race car impressive, but I think perhaps even more impressive is that these young people here from K-State are the ones that only designed and built this car and raised it. So they're going to tell us all about this. This car and some of the other cars that they've worked on over the past. Just a little bit about K-State, uh, the team. Uh, rep they represent PowerCat Motorsports, K-State Society of Automotive Engineers Formula Race Team. Formula SAE is the world's largest and most prestigious design competition with 13 international competitions and over 600 active teams. PowerCat Motorsports is proud to represent K-State in this competition every year since 1997. The premise of this design series is to design, manufacture, test, race, and present a fully functional open wheel, open cockpit race car. While housed in the mechanical and nuclear engineering department, the entirety of the work is completed by students from all across the campus. I'm going to turn it over to them, let them introduce themselves individually and get going. And thank you all again for coming. Let's give them a warm welcome. Yeah, so I'm Vance, I'm the president of the team, and I'm also the chassis lead. I'm Eric, I'm the drivetrain design lead. I'm Joe, and I'm the drivetrain understudy. I'm Ethan, I'm just studying all the things to learn more about it. Uh, my name is Peyton Lee, and I'm the engine lead. And my name is Wyatt Haug, I'm the suspension lead. And just provide a little bit of context about our team. Uh, there's just the six of us here today, um, but there's 20 to 30 other people that'll help throughout the year. Um, there's about 10 leads and then uh, about 10 understudies. So um, there's, there's quite a bit of people that um, put work into this car. So go ahead and get started. So like you said, this is part of the Society of Automotive Engineers. Um, and it's the collegiate design series with uh, 500 teams. And so uh, we compete throughout the year. Um, we like to do a lot of testing out at the Tuttle Creek Spillway. And so that's where we do most of our um, weekend testing. And then in, in addition to that, we go to a few SCCA events. So that'll be at places like Salina, Heartland Park, um, sometimes Kansas City or Lincoln, Nebraska for the solo nationals. And then the uh, uh, Formula SE competitions, they kind of bounce around sometimes. It, it just depends on the year. Um, like last year, we went to Las Vegas, Nevada, and then Brooklyn, Michigan. Um, and then this year, both the competitions are at Michigan. 
um, but in the past there's there's always like a Michigan competition but um, there's Lincoln Nebraska sometimes Fontana California and next year they're looking to go to uh, somewhere in Texas so at competition we have to pass uh, safety and technical inspection so it's a four-day event and so the first two days are strictly just making the car pass through tech since each car is completely unique and there's 120 different vehicles they have to make sure that all the cars are built to the formula SAE rules um, so it, it requires a, a lot of uh, scrutiny and just a lot of um, investigation and into how we built the car and, and looking over it and so the first event is tech inspection so that happens uh, Wednesday and then on Thursday we still are usually working through tech there's a few things we have to fix on the car and um, kind of refabricate if they see any issues and then um, also Thursday those are the dynamic safety tests so that's like the fuel and, and tilt tests and then um, we have to pass a noise test. So our exhaust has to be um, under 103 decibels at idle and then 110 at our red line. And then after that, we have the brakes test. So all four wheels have to um, lock up at the same time. And then, so once you make it through tech, um, some teams don't, it's just kind of hard. But after that is the presentation, design, and cost um, events. And so that'll be, um, I guess, Thursday and Friday, kind of both of those days for the static events. So presentation, it's kind of like a business scenario. They come up with a scenario each year that you just make a, a mock company for and um, just it's like a concept this year it has to do with um, like how would how would your company adapt to the um, change in uh, automotive field where we're moving to electric and how would you produce electric cars and things like that and then so design it's an event where each of our design leads talk through um, the designs of the car and there's judges for I think like six systems and so that's an hour-long event where they're really getting into the root of, of why and how we design certain things and um, then if they see us as one of the top teams we'll go into design finals and get even more questions asked for our design and then cost um, it, it just kind of breaks down each component of the car and how it was built and um, our, we, our team doesn't do very well with costs, m mostly because it's a carbon fiber monocoque and that's expensive. So there's not really a great way around that. But then after that, you have the dynamic events. So Friday we'll do Excel, skid pad, and autocross. And so Excel is a 75 meter, um, pretty much drag strip race. And then skid pad is a figure eight race where um, you go right twice and then left twice and they take your best time between both directions and average it. And then autocross is an SCCA style cone course where um, it's just a one lap event and you get two tries per driver for two drivers and your time for autocross sets up your position for um, the endurance event. And then so endurance is just like autocross where it's a coned SCCA course except it's a full loop and then you're put on the uh, course with um, six cars at one time and uh, it, that's the entirety of Saturday is the endurance event and so um, it, it's a really fun event and there's a driver swap in the middle and it's, it's like 23 kilometers I think um, it takes about 30 minutes to complete and then there's also a fuel efficiency that's um, part of the endurance they just measure how much fuel you use and so we race against 120 teams at the competition but um, the teams are sponsored by a lot of really large automotive companies so like this year there's Illinois they're sponsored by Fiat Chrysler Goodyear Ford things like that and then uh, University of Michigan they won the competition they're sponsored by Borg Warner um, in the past there's been a lot of 
international teams that'll come to the events. And then so that's where teams that are sponsored with like Red Bull, um, Stuttgart, Germany, which is um, Porsche, Mercedes, and a few other teams. And so since we get a lot of experience working on this car and building it, um, it's a really good opportunity for our alumni of the team to go on and work for automotive companies. So we have people that are working at uh, Fiat, Fiat Chrysler, Comp Cams, Spirit Aero Systems, um, Continental Tire, Holly, uh, Tesla, just to name a few. There's quite a few people in the automotive field still. And then so now we're going to break it into um, each of the systems of the car. And so I'm the chassis lead and um, so we build a carbon fiber monocoque and so what that is is a mixture of uh, 3K pre-impregnated carbon so the resin is infused into the carbon and there's four different types of uh, honeycomb core in there and so it's um, in, in this year's car it's one inch honeycomb core um, some of its aluminum some of its Nomex fiberglass just kind of depends and and so you have the option with building these cars you can either build a, a monocoque or build a steel tube frame we choose to build a monocoque um, one because we have the resources available to us being close to Wichita um, and and two it's uh, lighter and stiffer than a steel tube frame of the same or I guess of the of the same weight it's stiffer and, and of the same size it's lighter so but it is significantly harder to manufacture because of all the molds and, and different processes that are involved with making it and materials that go into it and so before we even make the chassis we have to prove that each of the reg each region of the car will be um, either stronger or, or equivalent or stronger than a steel tube frame and so we do this through structural tests and so we'll, we'll take um, I think it's like a 6 by 20 section of a carbon fiber sandwich panel which represents the different regions of the chassis. Um, we'll take it, do a three point bend and shear test um, and then we measure the force and displacement on it and from there there's a, 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 a spreadsheet that all the data gets input into which uh, proves that it's either stronger um, steel or not. And so to make the chassis, we start with MDF molds and then um, from there we'll lay carbon over the MDF molds and, and then that creates the carbon tool which it's wrapped in breather and this is pretty much how we lay it up. It's upside down and you lay up, up inside of it. Um, and then so once the tool is made, we lay up inside of the tool which is shown here. Peyton is right there. Um, we, we lay up with, there's templates of each region of the chassis and so um, with the first layer it takes like 10 hours and, and we'll do, um, we'll start from the front and go all the way to the back and make sure there's like one inch overlap between each piece and so um, from there after the first layer we have templates for the next 12 layers, oh wait you should go back. Um, and then this is the, the middle of the chassis. It's kind of hard to see, I guess, if you're far away, but um, there's honeycomb core inside of there, and it's just a bunch of pieces. Uh, we had a water jet to make sure it was dimensionally accurate, but, but yeah, it's, there's a lot of different regions for um, different structural parts of the car. And then, so this, this is a picture from our uh, structural equivalency spreadsheet. Um, but it just kind of shows the variance in how many layers of carbon and then different types of core that we use. Um, so throughout the chassis there's just uh, a variance of 8, 12, and 20 layers and then just a bunch of different types of core. And then we have the steel roll hoop and then um, headrest and, and things. And then so the chassis when, when it's fully made and um, all the carbon's laid up and then we have the final vacuum bag around it um, we take it to Wichita and have it cured out at a Wichita Tech and so it, it goes in an autoclave cure cycle for about eight hours. 
And then I'll pass it over to Peyton. He's going to talk about engine. All right. So as I introduced myself earlier, um, my name is Peyton Lee. I was the, I'm the engine lead for this year. And so for the engine system, um, my biggest job is just making sure that this car moves and moves reliably. Um, so our engine setup is a Triumph Street Triple 675. We are, re we are restricted to 710 cc, so any engine that you can get underneath that level is allowed as long as it's four stroke and powered by gasoline or E85. Um, so what we do with our engine, we essentially keep it stock block, but we put in 16 to one compression pistons, we design our own custom intake, and then we do a titanium exhaust system. It's not a lot of work on the outside when you look at it, but once you get into the nitty gritty stuff, it really adds on to things and it's a very broad system. So I'm responsible for oiling and lubrication, cooling, intake, fuel injection, tuning the car, doing the exhaust, and all while interacting with Eric, our drivetrain lead, and making sure things keep the car running throughout the whole race. So uh, one of the cool things about our car is we run a dry sump system. As a lot of you know, when you are driving a motorcycle, your engine is vertical up in the motorcycle. And when you're going through corners, you have your motorcycle leaning through your corners. So all your oil stays in the bottom of your oil pan. You don't have any issues with starvation. Now, in our car, the oil will slosh around in the bottom of the engine. And because we have to lower the cent center of gravity of our car, we have to chop off the bottom of our oil pan. Sorry, I messed up the mic there. Um, and so when this happens, you lose oil pressure and you start starving the engine of oil. So what we do is we make a custom dry sump system. And what this does is it picks up oil from various parts of the car, sends it off to an external reservoir where it decavitates the oil and then sends it back into the engine and we maintain oil pressure. Um, so I had just mentioned this earlier, so I'm responsible for all of these things. Um, and as you can see here, this is our intake setup for this year. Um, I guess I can pass this around. This is, yeah, here you go. So that is our intake and we can pass this around too. Why can you do this? So you'll notice that our intake and our exhaust are kind of similarly designed in that you can see where the three runners all converge in the same way. And so when we're designing our intake, if you want to go to the next slide. So as we're designing our intake, you have a problem with um, airflow distribution. And one of these problems is if you've got all your runners in the same line, then as the air is going down the center, then your air wants to just go down that center runner. And so it doesn't want to flow to the outside. So what we did is we looked at the design of our exhaust header, which is made out of titanium. and we thought, well, what we can do is just mimic that design so it all converges in the same spot and then you get relatively even air distribution. So when we're designing our intake, we've got a few restrictions. We run E85, so per the rules, we have to run a 19 millimeter restrictor. So that's about the size of a penny for, um, for reference. Uh, the stock engine comes with roughly 30, 30 millimeter individual throttle bodies. And then so that's, I don't know how much area that is, but that's quite a bit. And then we're pulling now through one single 19 millimeter restrictor the size of a penny. And after all the things we do with the engine, we make roughly the same amount of horsepower that the engine does stock after all of our modifications, fuel injection E85. The stock engine makes about 105 horsepower. We make about 90. And in a car that weighs roughly 500 pounds, that has the power to weight ratio of roughly like a Dodge Viper on steroids. Um, and then, so for sound, um, as you guys see the exhaust that's getting passed around, we have to pass sound. Um, this engine is kind of weird. At full throttle, it's actually quieter than it is at idle just because of the way decibel readings are. Um, so DBC means that this is low frequency. So if you've ever listened to someone bumping the bass going down the road, you know it carries quite a ways. And so that can damage your hearing. And so you have to be below this. So roughly 110 decibels shouldn't damage your hearing that bad, even under sustained. 
And so that's why we have to design our exhaust system around this. And then, so our engine dyno, um, we use a water break dyno. It's um, a pretty simple yet also complicated system if you've never looked at it before. So what it does is it's essentially a turbine and then you have water pressure going through the turbine and then your wheels power the turbine. And so what this does is this produces a load on a load cell and depending on how much load and torque that engine is producing through that, then we get a horsepower reading. And from this we can create graphs and then reference this and then what we do is we see how much power we're making, but we can also adjust our fuel maps and fuel injection and tune the car to produce the most power over a long range of RPM as possible. And then now I'm going to pass this off to Wyatt. All right, guys, like I said before, my name is Wyatt Haug. I'm the suspension lead, so I'm responsible for designing and manufacturing all of the suspension. Um, just an overview of the suspension, I'm sure you all know how suspension works. Uh, it controls the tire movement relative to the chassis, so bumps, uh, turning, it, it keeps that tire in contact with the ground. Um, we run a fully independent double wishbone suspension with uh, push rods and bell cranks, so our dampers are inboard. You can see them on the back there. This is actually our new car. This is what we're working on right now. Um, so you see the dampers there and then our other dampers are on the top up there for the front. So just an overview of all of our components. We have our push rods right here, our bell cranks which are what actually uh, take that, that movement and translate it into the damper. Um, we have our dampers, our uprights, all the mounting tabs, all of our A-arms. Uh, our steering rack and tie rods and of course all of your spherical bearings and all of your heim joints and all that. So starting off, um, you design your suspension around your tire. So you, we want to pick, so you pick a tire and then you start designing your kinematics around that. And so after you have your tire figured out, which is based on lots of uh, different tire data, um, different simulation softwares that give us a bunch of graphs of uh, various various data from the tire. Um, we designed the kinematics and all the geometry in uh, simulation software. So we've used Lotus Shark and Adams Car. Um, personally, I like Adams Car better because you can actually simulate lap times with that software. Whereas Lotus Shark, it just gives you um, camber curves, uh, your like dynamic camber change or dynamic toe change. Those those kinds of things. Um, and then here, here's a couple pictures. This is our upright, and we run in Olin's TTX 25 damper. And then here's a picture of our bell cranks. And all, most everything, as far as suspension goes, is manufactured in-house. Um, we make all of our control arms, push rods, tie rods, bell cranks, all of our mounting tabs. And the, about the only thing that we don't make is, of course, like the wheels, the tires. Um, we don't make the uprights because it is a fairly complex part and we only have three axis CNC's. So we have a company called Globe Engineering make those for us on their five axis. But getting into that, um, so we use various different uh, methods of manufacturing the suspension, one of which is welding all the A-arms um, and then mainly is all CNC machining. So this is all parts for our new car. Um, these are the front bell cranks. Uh, these are, this is the uh, front damper tabs and that is our front lower uh, A-arm tabs. You use arrow. Do arrow. So our arrow lead's not here, but I'll, I'll give the overview for its system. So um, as you can see, we make the rear wing, we have an under tray for ground effects, and then the front wing and side pods, and then the uh, wing mounts and so all of this is first designed in a uh, CFD software um, and so in the past we've used Star CCM or SolidWorks to do the CFD um, and yeah and so when it's made uh, all of the aero components are wet lay carbon fiber and so 
These are done over a variety of different molds. Um, for the wing elements, it's a carbon one-piece mold, so um, each of the elements is made from, um, it's, it's all one piece, and then it's bonded together with aluminum inserts that are in, inside, so you got inserts that span, I think, like right here, here, and, and here. Um, and then there's different carbon mounts for them. Don't, don't move that yet. Um, and so, yeah, the under trays and MDF mold and um, different things. Yeah, and so here's a bunch of different pictures of the, the wings getting manufactured. And so you can just see all the different types of molds and um, kind of the components that go into it. But I don't know the exact uh, downforce specs on this aero package, but at 35 miles an hour, I think it makes what maybe like 60 to 80 pounds of downforce. And then at 60 miles per hour, I want to say it's up into the 150 to 200. Um, one, one, he says 180 pounds of downforce at 60 miles an hour. So the average speed when we're racing is about 30, 35 miles an hour, but the peak speed is around 60 to 70. Um, that's by design from FSA because they don't want us going over 60 or 70 because then it's kind of runs the risk of crashes and stuff. And so our competitions are, are relatively safe in, in the way that there's not really any crashes since it's an SCCA style course. It's all cones and things. So um, but just the, the arrow being designed to 60 miles an hour is a, just an example of these aren't designed to go over 100, but the car definitely could go well into the 100 since the engine produces quite a bit of horsepower and things like, and the car's light. And then, so our, I'll go into ergo also, and I can pass this around. Oh, yeah. Um, so Ethan's passing around the 3D printed and carbon fiber um, steering wheel. And so that has paddle shifters and um, a few buttons for display controls and um, neutral and a few other things. And so um, our ergo lead is responsible for the brakes, shifting, clutch, uh, steering wheel, driver controls, pedal box, and um, general safety. And so um, with that, it's really just kind of making the driver comfortable. And so to do that, um, the steering wheel is one of our big functions of making sure that it's usable. Um, this year, some of the updates we did for that were, instead of using U-joint uh, uh, steering shaft, it's a straight steering shaft, so it's more direct. Um, with the road and, and try to minimize some of the compliance seen from the U-joints. Um, and then we also have a few updates with the throttle and, um, yeah, I guess that's, that's about, oh, the headrest is a little bit different. Um, but yeah, so the main goal is really to just make the driver feel comfortable and have all the controls easy to use. Um, so some of the other things I haven't mentioned that include ergo are the, the firewall, or firewall, seat belts, um, driver gear, things like that. Um, so here's a few pictures of what our brakes look like. So we use um, Brembo brake calipers with uh, steel rotors on the front and then the rear are AP racing calipers. Um, I think the Brembo's are off of a motorcycle, a Ducati. A, a Ducati motorcycle, and then the AP calipers, I want to say are off like a moped or, or something. They're, they're, they're really small, they're pretty tiny if you see them. Um, but so, yeah, from there, so when the ergo stuff uh, gets designed, you got to do some deceleration testing, you got to analyze the temperature of the brakes, make sure that over the uh, length of the endurance race that the brake rotors don't get too hot and overheat. Um, so we kind of studied that a little bit. And then um, there's a lot of work that goes into, uh, I guess one thing we haven't mentioned is, so we have paddle shifters and that engages the pneumatic shifting system. And so um, with that, we're, we've had to tune the uh, shift times and, and just how that shifts the car quite a bit because it's, 
Uh, it's mostly re re reliable now, but in the past few years, it, it's taken quite a bit of work to get it to shift reliably and consistently. So the electrical, I'm gonna hand that to Wyatt. So for electrical, electrical is responsible for all the engine management. So the ECU, the dash, all the data acquisition. Um, we had thought about Active Air. We haven't implemented it onto a car just because it is heavy. Um, and then also shifting, um, neutral, you know, just every, everything as far as making the car communicate with all the different components. So, like I said, they're responsible for the ECU, um, fuses, battery, the main electrical cutoff. So we have to have a main uh, kill switch on the outside and then also a kill switch on the dash. Um, we use a MoTeC M130 ECU and then a MoTeC C185 uh, DAC, which also is our dash. So like I said, it's a C185, but it acts as our data acquisition system. So we get logs from suspension, which are our linear potentiometers. So it tracks um, how, we have one on each corner of the car, it tracks how much uh, each corner compresses or rebounds. Um, we also have uh, logs for uh, like air pressure for the lines for the uh, shifting. And then also, of course, all the engines, so oil pressure, fuel pressure, um, crankcase pressure, uh, air fuel ratio, all that good stuff. Um, and that, all that is used to verify. So for like suspension, um, using our linear potentiometers, it can verify our roll stiffness based on how, how much one side rebounds and how much the other side compresses. Um, it also allows for changes on the fly. So if you see that your air fuel ratio is, if it's too rich, you can take fuel out or if it's too lean, add fuel in, and so on and so on. And then also our dash is set up to display warnings. So if you lose oil pressure, it'll pop up a warning and start flashing at you and it'll tell you that you have no, no more oil pressure and your engine's about to blow up. <laughs> so, and then for manufacturing, we, you lay it all out on the, um, it, we have a jig board, it's all laid out um, for all the links of the wires and uh, that all the links of the wires is determined using SolidWorks. So just measuring from where the fuse box is going to be back to where all the wires need to go. Um, our, EC, our ECU connector, so it all starts with there and then just branches off out into everything else. And then I'll turn it over to Eric for a drivetrain. Yeah, so the drivetrain is responsible for uh, transmitting power from the engine to the wheels. Um, and then so for a transmission and a clutch, we just use what's incorporated in the motorcycle engine already. Um, and then you can go to the next slide. So this is what the drivetrain system kind of looks like. We've got our carrier that holds the differential. Um, we use a center, the gears from a center diff of an Audi uh, with a custom housing. Um, and then it's chain drive to the sprocket. And then we've got our half shafts and the hubs. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so there's the differential that comes out of the Audi. Like I said, we have a custom uh, diff housing for that that we transferred into. I'll do business. And so in addition to all of the leads that focus on making the car and um, producing things, we have a few people on our business team and so they're responsible for keeping track of all of our expenses and receipts throughout the year which is a pretty large task um, and then they do a lot of uh, sponsor outreach and um, just sponsor relations and things like that and then they're also responsible for preparing a business presentation and cost report at competition and so yeah like I said they uh, keep track of a lot of the expenses and pretty much grill into us if we're spending too much money. <laughs> and so we, we have social media on Facebook, Instagram, uh, we have a YouTube page also. Um, so if you want to follow us throughout the year, we post a lot on there. We also have a website. Uh, it used to be powercatmotorsports.com, but uh, we lost the domain. So now it's just look up K State. FSAE or Formula SAE 
and you can find our, our web page. Um, but follow us on social media to see you post throughout the year. And so you can donate to our team through our website or by um, emailing me, I guess my information is on the website. Um, but there is a page that says how to donate. It's through the K-State Foundation. Um, and you can just write a check to them or there's an online link to donate also. So now we'd like to open it up for any of you guys if you'd like to ask questions. I got a chassis question for you. You mentioned you take a piece of the carbon fiber panel and you do a three-point bend rate test on it. Are you testing that to failure or are you just looking for a certain amount of force um, maximum force at minimum deflection or what are you really looking for in that panel? So it goes to failure um, and then from that they take the max uh, load and then the max displacement and then they the spreadsheet has a bunch of different calculations for like buckling modulus um, and just can't think of them at, off the top of my head, but it, it compares similar properties of that uh, size of panel to the same size of a one inch steel tube. And it just sees if it's stronger or not. And, and so yeah, it's to, to failure. So that's part of the requirements around design. You've got to hit a certain, you got to, you got to be able to demonstrate that the carbon fiber is as strong as steel basically. Yep. Okay, thank you. Yep, it's required. Um, and to go to competition, a tech judge has to like fully approve all of your testing and testing methods and then at the tech inspection um, we present them all the panels and there's a box that they look through and they verify that they're the same panels as what's in the chassis also. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, I noticed you said you used uh, a version of STAR for your aerodynamics. Mm -hmm. um, they used to I also have for the combustion process started. Uh, have you used that any for, in, for the engine? Do you want me to answer that? Yeah. Uh, the answer is no on that. Um, what, what we use is a GT suite. Um, I'm, I'm still learning everything. Um, I'm only a sophomore. And so I haven't had too much experience with it, but we use GT power to simulate um, when we're designing our intake and our exhaust, um, we use that to simulate um, different power curves and how we can affect our intake design by di differentiating your plenum sizes and your runners and whatnot. You used to be starving, now you do modify the piston and the inside of the engine too if you're allowed to do that. I'll have to look into that. because I'm, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know whether the star still does that, but there's other ones. There's Deer and Detroit Diesel and Southwest Research used to use uh, versions of star. Yeah, I know uh, GT Power is the industry standard from what I've talked to, like other companies, that they use that. Um, I'm not sure about star CCM. I don't know anything about it, um, but I'll have to look into that. you're saying you're working on a new car right now uh, what is the average age for the car is it like one every year one every few years yeah so we produce a new car every year um, and so this was the 2019 to 2021 car because of COVID it kind of made it a two-year car um, but yeah we make a new one every year and so we'll, we'll start designing it over the summer and then a lot of the actual work or we come up with the, the concepts of what we want to do over the summer and then we start designing it from August till about November and then from December till April um, that's when we build the car and and then we compete in May and June usually and then we'll test throughout that but yeah so it's new cars every year and they're all cat names so this car is Caracal um, this year's car that we're um, going to compete with is Serval. So we're kind of into some of the more exotic cat names because we've, the, the earlier ones were like Cougar, Bobcat, Jag, Lynx, um, Panther, Pan Puma. We try not to use Cheetah or Lion because kind of have to build a really fast car for that. <laughs> 
rule. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's part of the rules to build a new car every year. Once a car is competed, it has a year from that time that it competed to compete again. And then after that year, you can't compete with it. But that's strictly the chassis. So you can't yeah. reuse a chassis a year, but you could strip the chassis clean <laughs> and put that on the next car and then use all the same components. Yeah, that's what they classify as a car is you have to have a new chassis. However, in reality, you build a new car yeah. every year. So do you, what, yeah. what does it cost to uh, produce a car? And how do you do in competition? Um, so cost, it's kind of an interesting question because most of the cars sponsored in terms of materials and time and things like that. But so we get a good chunk of uh, cash from the university, from the College of Engineering, uh, the Mechanical and Nuclear Engineering Department, and then uh, SGA, Student Governing Association. And so that's about 30000 a year um, from that. And that's kind of our budget for traveling and um, building and buying tools and things. But that's just what we provide, what we get for there. In terms of overall money spent to make the cars, probably into the 100000 range because the carbon we use is about 20 to 40,000. Um, all of the autoclave trips that we do with that is quite expensive. Um, and then there's just a lot of material that's, that's donated and machine time that uh, would, if this were a production car, would really ramp the cost up quite a bit. But um, we, so we, we track that through our own spreadsheet um, we reach out to each of our sponsors and try to get an estimated value of what they appraise their work from and, or material that they donate. And that goes into the 100000 range. But the exact value, it's kind of hard to pinpoint. Do I remember right from last year that some of these cars you've kept and some of them you have dismantled? Or was that... Yeah. Um, so we have... Six. Uh, six to seven so, some cars are like kind of Skeleton. skeletons but yeah we have about six cars that look close to this may not be fully running um, but yeah there's there's a few in, in storage if you go to the engineering building there's three on display right now um, when we get this one back there's this would be four there's one up and that's on display in the engineering building by itself in, in front of the door that's Bobcat from 2016. And then we have two, two more at a different shop. And the only reason why they get dismantled is because some of the components are very expensive and do get carried over. So like the dampers, the ECU, the dash, those, those components all get carried over to from very old cars to new cars. And I just remembered that I didn't answer the second part of his question. He asked how we did at competition. Um, so at competition, this last year we finished 11th out of 37 in Las Vegas and then 15th out of 51 in Michigan. Um, and then the year before that we finished 37th out of 120 at Michigan, so that'd be 2019. And then at Lincoln, a month after that, we finished 28th out of 80. Um, and so our goal this year is to finish uh, 15th out of 120. So. Oh, we're winning. <laughs> <laughs> it's, when you go racing, you want to win, but it's, it's really hard to make progress when you, when you build the cars each year. There's a lot of development that needs to be done to, to really make that step up into winning the competition. It's, it's quite a task. Oh. With the, with the uh, compression ratio as high as it is, if you use gasoline, wouldn't you have to use 110 race gas? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, competition regulations are 110 octane or E85. You have the choice of two. Um, we used to run 110 up until 2019 and then this car is the first car that we ran E85 in and 
From that, we were able to really decrease the amount of like detonation that we were experiencing. But we also had about a jump of, I think like 15% in horsepower when we switched to E85, just from like additional fuel and cooling that you can get. Um, but if you run 110, you also get um, a looser restrictor. So you get a 20 millimeter instead of a 19. Um, but yeah, so we do have to run really high octane. Otherwise it's gonna start detonating. Then one, one other category, you're in a fuel economy class too, so if you're running E85, it's going to, are all the cars that run E85 in the same class? Yeah, so they have a uh, different scale. Even though like the fuel economy is, the competition for fuel economy is competition wide, it's all of the cars, they scale the E85 cars differently than 110 octane just because you use, I think it's like 20% more fuel or something. Is that all? I figured it'd be almost double. It's, it's, quite, it's quite a bit more, but I don't think it's quite double. For reference, so we have a 675 Triumph at the Endurance Event in Michigan this year. I think we burned 1.6 gallons. 1.6 gallons. Over 12.67 miles. And then, I mean, that's... So you start the event with they fill you up as you, as you roll over to staging, and then they let you uh, heat your car up. And so between heating it up and sitting and staging for a minute or two, and then driving is 1.6 gallons. So our fuel tank last year was three gallons, and this year we're trying to cut it close and make it about 2.1 gallons. So. I was going to say, uh, you mentioned that they switch out the drivers for the one race. Who determines who gets to be the drivers? Um, so the short answer is whoever's fastest. Um, but the long answer is it kind of depends on, on, like, we initially choose the drivers by if anyone has experience driving. Um, like, for me, I grew up racing quarter midgets and then micro sprints. So naturally this thing was pretty easy for me to drive um, but then for everyone else who doesn't have experience we just try to give everyone seat time and um, as, as we test throughout the year just make sure all the people who are leads who've earned the right to drive um, get to see and then around April we'll test everyone and try to time them on a, on, on a closed course and see who's fastest so just kind of depends <clears throat> perhaps i missed some but this seems like a club project uh, maybe i'm wrong on extracurricular if i'm right on that can anybody else get involved that may not be from the engineering i know there was business person but mm -hmm. is it open to anybody else yeah so the only requirement is that you're a K-State student. Um, and so yeah, anyone of any major can join the team. And, and yeah, there's no requirements, no age requirements. Um, so yeah, if you're a freshman, senior, grad student at K-State, it, it doesn't matter. We're willing to accept anyone on the team. Earlier you said that it'll run over 100 mile an hour. Has uh, any one of you guys driven this car over 100 and how fast will it go? I think we hit 85 doing 0 to 60 tests. Did we? Yeah. A 0 to 60 is like 3.1 seconds in this thing. I don't think it's that fast. It, Blaine had it, it was 3.1 or 3.2 because he had the, we have um, one of the guys who was on the team last year who works for Holly now, does a lot of drag, yeah. Does a lot of drag racing, um, and so he has like a like a GPS thing, and so he timed it. And why I don't think you were there. Um, I was, I was there because this was it was like it was October of our freshman year. But that was. Um, anyway, he, he was brought like three point two seconds. He brought his draggy. I thought he brought his draggy out there when he, we took off all the arrow and did all that stuff. Yeah, it was like three point two seconds. But that was without arrow, though. Still 3.2 seconds. Well, but <laughs> that's not what it does in competition, though. A number is a number, okay. I think. <laughs> but yeah, I don't think any of us have actually driven over, driven this thing over 100 miles an hour. Um, 
Maybe when we go to Salina for the SEC events, it might get kind of close because those are pretty straight. Um, but we try not to because <laughs> it's it's really designed for the uh, 30 to 70 mile an hour range. <laughs> Since we were talking about the arrow, um, you said it was a weight penalty. Uh, I, I don't know if you hit a number for having a dynamic uh, downforce. Would that add on a lot of extra weight or just enough to, does it put you into a separate class or is it just adding weight to the vehicle, which is a detriment? It just adds weight to the vehicle. So most teams have aero. Um, however, at Michigan this year, for example, you don't, you don't really need it. <laughs> it. It depends on what your philosophy is as a team. Um, so yeah, it, on, on our car, I think our whole aero package from front and rear wings, under tray, side pods, I think in mounts, I think it adds 40 pounds. Um, and so the, the weight to downforce benefit for us is questionable. It definitely makes the car more stable and easier to drive at high speeds. Um, however, at Michigan this year, the team that placed second in the endurance event didn't have aero. And there's also, I think, team that was maybe eighth that didn't have aero. Um, and that was because the course was so tight that we weren't going fast except for on straightaways and there was no sweeper corners. And so like the, the high speed sweeping turns is, is really where you'd see the benefit of having a lot of downforce. Um, so in most cases, aero is a benefit, but it's really kind of dependent on how the track layout is each year. Um, so yeah, for us, we see it as a benefit, um, but we definitely could reduce some weight in our aero package and make it more simple. But yeah, it's just an addition. Um, teams with aero compete against teams without aero. And, and so at competition, the only uh, real divisions are if you run a uh, internal combustion engine or an electric motor, um, and, that, and that's it. So all the other uh, rules that allow you to change the different components and things, it's just teams compete against each other um, and every car is completely different, which is what makes it pretty exciting. So would you be changing over to trying to race electric cars in sometime? Um, in the near future, no, but maybe in five to ten years, maybe. Um, Only if they make us. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's quite a bit of work. We're all and, and so one thing that's pretty interesting, you'd think running 12.67 miles uh, isn't that far for a car to drive and not break. Um, but the, at the endurance event, only 50% of teams actually finish. And some teams, I think maybe a, a quarter of the teams don't even make it to the endurance event because they didn't pass tech. But for the electric vehicles, the number of teams that don't even make it through the tech inspection is probably like three quarters of the teams. I think only two this made it through Vegas. Yeah, Vegas had two. So there's, at Michigan, I want to say there was 10, 10, or 12, yeah. 10 or 12 electric cars and three made it through tech. And at Vegas, it was about the same. Um, so it's, it's really hard because the rules are a lot uh, more strict because you have to pass all of their electrical tests and make sure that nothing shorts out and it's safe and you don't electrocute the driver and <laughs> or, the, or the car burns down from, I guess, having too much current in some areas of the car. Oh. You guys are obviously having a lot of fun doing what, with this project. What, what do you see, what field do you see yourselves going into at the graduation? I guess this will be a question for all of us. Um, for myself, um, I wouldn't mind working for an automotive company. It would be interesting and uh, this team has definitely given me a lot of experience for that and an easy entry into that field. Um, because when we go to competition, there's, 
about 10 companies that are walking around the pits hiring. That number may be even more, but um, there's, peop there's recruiters that will walk to each pit and say, hey, who's the smartest person here? And <laughs> give me their resume. And they'll, they'll, look, they'll even look at certain parts of the car and if something flashes their eye, they're like, hey, can I talk to the person that designed the suspension? We, we had about five people ask that this last uh, competition. Um, but yeah, so for me, I'd like to work for an automotive for a company that, that's just similar to FSA where you get a build, design, and prototype and, and just be in the entire process of it. I don't want to be sitting at a desk all day and, and not actually be involved in the, the end product. I want to see the whole thing. I think I'd like to be somewhere in aftermarket. I I don't think I'd I don't think I'd want to do OEM. It just seems it seems boring to be honest. So yeah. So I'm a senior and I'm graduating here in May. So I'm going to be working for Great Plains Kubota designing skid steers. So not quite a race car, but still should be a good time. And I'm looking to work in aerospace when I graduate. I, uh, I grew up in aviation. I'm not much of a car guy compared to these guys. But I definitely like to end up in aerospace. Uh, I still got three more years, so it's kind of early for me to say right now. But I would say probably same as Wyatt, um, aftermarket. Um, I don't know if I want to deal with the stresses of staying in motorsports because I don't get any sleep. Um, I know none of these guys do either. So I don't know if I want to have that as a career. I have to say aftermarket components or uh, robotics. So. Let's give these guys a warm. young man you all are and I uh, can't imagine the time that you spend in this and, and I think you may have someone enrolling in K-State next, next semester to join the team. Sounds like it. Maybe some more too. So anyway, it's fascinating. I know these guys will be glad to stay around for a little bit and answer questions. Come check out.